This week on Quality Digest Live, we examine the regulatory environment for 3D printed medical devices. Plus, uh, Gary Confalone of ECM and the CMSC chats with us about metrology training. That and more when we come back. Welcome back to Quality Digest Live for October 21st, 2016. QDL is your weekly look at who and what is making the news in the world of quality. I'm Dirk Ducharme, Editor-in-Chief of Quality Digest. And I'm Quality Digest publisher, Mike Richmond. Well, do you suffer from security fatigue? Yes. Do you? Do your customers? Yes. Even more important, do you even know what the heck security fatigue yes. is? <laughs> or why we're talking about it? Do you know why we're talking about yes, it? Yes, I know why we're talking about you it. You know a lot, Dirk. <laughs> well, Dirk, Dirk is a fatiguing individual, yeah, so yes, that's not, not a surprise. But to bring you all fully up to speed, in case you don't know, the phrase security fatigue refers to the tendency of internet users to take shortcuts to avoid the perceived inconveniences of completely protecting themselves online. And this often takes the form of reusing the same passwords on site across the net, uh, for instance. It can also manifest itself in users giving up on purchases because they just don't want to deal with the hassle of site registration right. and or of the complicated checkout procedures. And, and those lost revenues are really a, a pretty big problem for internet retailers. That's sure. actually maybe the biggest problem for internet, yeah. internet retailers. And actually, we do some online retailing and we know that we've looked at that checkout procedure oh, yeah. really, really closely because, you know, it's a balance between protecting people and making sure that they can, they can do what they got to do but also protect it, but also getting the sale, getting the order. <laughs> that's right, I'm so right? tired, I'm just gonna bail. Bail, right? yeah. that's, that's a real yeah. problem. Well, a, a recent news release from the National Institute of Standards and, and Technology explains this phenomenon and offers some easily implemented solutions. And we linked out to the breathlessly titled piece, Security Fatigue Can Cause Computer Users to Feel Hopeless and Act Recklessly, new study suggests in Tuesday's issue of Quality Digest. I love that headline. Kind of like some of our headlines, they just go on. So evocative, on. I mean, it just gives you that emotional punch recklessly, yes, I love that. All right, well, according to the co-authors of this study mentioned in the article, cognitive psychologist Brian Stanton and computer scientist Mary uh, Theophanos, there are three steps that organizations that wish to maximize online sales can take to overcome the problem of security fatigue. Uh, the first one is to limit the number of security decisions that the user needs to make, right? I mean, right. you know, if you, if you have them log in once and you ask them for their credentials, maybe try to autofill that or make it a little easier <laughs> right. going forward so they don't have to, and you know, if they make a mistake, the other thing is don't make them have to re-enter the Everything whole thing Everything all over again, right, <laughs> you yeah. know, it's like, <laughs> just leave it there, right? Yeah. Uh, another thing is, is ensure that it's easy for users to consistently choose proper security actions. Make sure they know what they're supposed to do and they don't have yeah. to, to do things that they don't have to do extraneously. Uh, and then design for consistent decision making whenever possible. So if you have one page that asks somebody to do something with, with a pull down, then make sure that it's consistent throughout the look and feel and the, the way you're asking them to do it. Because right. if you don't, if you make it too, con too convoluted, again, you're going to lose people and they're going to bail because they're going to say the heck with this. I don't right. want to deal with having to do all the security. Well, for more information on this piece and, and, and the, the whole procedure of, of security fatigue and what that's all about, be sure to check out the story link. It's just below the video player page right down there. Uh, all the stories we're going to be covering on today's show are right down there. You can check them out. And that, that's a good a good article. Hey, I, you know what? If you're, if you're an internet retailer, if you're selling anything online, you got to be aware of that, that problem, yeah. it's a big problem. Yeah, I mean, the smart thing to do is go and look at the successful online retail, like Amazon, Amazon. Yeah. what are they doing? Uh, that's probably a pretty good example of <clears throat> how to do things you know, the right way. That's exactly right. Yeah. Yeah. All right, well, so for those of you who follow 3D printing, there was a, uh, a really good article from Scott Rader. Uh, Scott uh, founded and leads the medical solutions team at Stratasys, that's the 3D printing and additive manufacturing company. The article, uh, The Evolving Regulatory Landscape of 3D Printed Medical Products, <clears throat> appeared in Tuesday's edition of Quality Digest Daily, and it addresses the concerns that the making of 
personalized medical devices would require some sort of new regulatory process. So, you know, obviously, Rader is addressing medical device manufacturers who are concerned that they might have to jump through different hoops than they already jumped through to get uh, FDA clearance on personalized products, which is usually what we're talking about when we talk about uh, 3D printing and medical devices. You know, so kind of those those medical devices, prosthetics or implants that are custom fit for you specifically. And there's been a lot of questions about, well, how's the FDA do with that? Right. Well, in general, the answer to this is they don't do anything different. Uh, for the most part, the FDA doesn't differentiate on how a part is manufactured, or whether it's injection molding or machining or stamping or casting or additive manufacturing. The FDA is really interested in the finished product's uh, materials, what goes into it, its function, and of course, more than anything, it's safety. Mm. That's what they're really looking at. And the existing uh, FDA process, the, the 510K for instance, works just as well for 3D, 3D printed devices as for traditionally manufactured devices, so says uh, the author uh, of the article, Rader. And it's not just Rader. Uh, the FDA writing in the 3D Printing and Medicine Journal said that Quote, despite some new technological characteristics of additive manufacturing, this has not changed the regulatory pathway for medical products that are reviewed by the FDA. This not only applies to pre-market review, but also to manufacturing quality during production, end quote. So, by the way, uh, as of March 2016, there were 88 medical products cleared or approved by the FDA for sale that are produced using 3D printing. Uh, 3D print, and these went through, there was nothing special. In the special hoops, they went through the usual FDA process for getting any medical product approved. And so there's eight, uh, 88 out, uh, of them out there. And a couple of them I thought were interesting. I just want to throw them out in case you aren't following this at all, um, or this topic. They are 3D printed pills, no, mm -hmm. 3D printed pharmaceuticals. Mm -hmm. uh, in this case, uh, there's a pill that was 3D printed because they wanted it to have uh, extra porosity so that it would dissolve oh. almost instantly in the mouth. Mm -hmm. And the, the easiest way to do that, it turned out, was 3D printing. Mm -hmm. Uh, also, uh, some of you heard of these orthopedic implants used in facial reconstruction surgery. So you might think, okay, so re regarding that last one, what about patient matched devices or colloquially custom devices. These are the devices that are tailored for a patient rather than mass produced. Well, basically the same thing applies. And uh, in this case, the manufacturer submits uh, via the usual process, the possible range or envelope that that personalized device might fall within. And, and Rader gives a really good example. I'm just gonna quote him uh, directly from the article because he does a really good job on this. So he says, a manufacturer can create a design space wherein important factors such as height, weight, uh, pelvic girdle dimensions, femoral offset, residual femoral shaft, and other factors become the mapping boundaries of the design space. The manufacturer can then prove the veracity of the implant design to the outer limits of that design space, both maximum and minimum, and the relevant and agreed upon sample in the inside of that design space to prove that the product will work across the, the mass, vast majority of patients matched to the product. So what he's saying basically here, I think you get the idea, is you prove that your device will work within, within a particular envelope, with a particular physical envelope, let's say, right? So, because you don't know different size patients and so forth, you know, might be this big, that big, might have these dimensions and so forth. Will your product work within the boundaries of this envelope? And then you give the FDA a sample of within that envelope so they can make sure that the product just simply works, right? So as long as your specific patient's requirements fall within that envelope, you're good to go. Right, you can just 3D print that part for that patient. It falls within an envelope. FDA doesn't need to know anything special about it. You're within what has been approved by the FDA. Now, if a patient falls outside that space, and you're gonna have to 3D print something that's outside that envelope, then again, it's no different than now, which is the doctor has to find another route. They can't use that device because it isn't cleared by the FDA to work outside the envelope that has been cleared by them, right? Mm -hmm. So, so and what, which is true now. You know, a, a doctor right. shouldn't be t using a product outside its, mm -hmm. what it's designed to do. Right. The FDA's cleared it for one thing, that's what you use it for. So the upshot of all this is, that the FDA isn't really looking at 3D printing any differently 
for the most part. Um, and as far as future technologies like biological printing, which is a fascinating new thing coming down the pike, isn't fully realized yet, the FDA is keeping an eye on those technologies and, and we can assume they're going to issue guidance on them as they approach real world application. So. In a way, the FDA is doing the same thing as the National Highway and Transportation Safety Administration guidelines regarding self-driving cars mm. are doing that we spoke of last week. Remember we talked about last week, self-driving cars, the, the, uh, the, the government is trying to not be too proscriptive mm -hmm. on the design requirements. They want there to be innovation. They still want safety in mind, but they don't want to so prescribe what uh, a self-driving car is going to look like mm -hmm. that they hamper innovation. The same thing is going on with the FDA. Safety is paramount, but there's some leeway in terms of how you are going to design new innovations for the future. So I think that's, uh, that's actually pretty interesting that mm -hmm. the technology is moving so fast that the government is really having to yeah. take a different approach to uh, to laws and regulations regarding safety uh, that they can't be too prescriptive because technology is moving faster than you could possibly yeah. make make too prescriptive of, of rules yeah. in terms of the actual specifics. You want safety guidelines, yeah. but the actual design guidelines, you've got to leave those a little bit open. Well, sure, and the FDA is going to have a lot of issues with this going forward. As you mentioned, biologics. Oh, uh, sure. You know, yeah. I mean, this idea that at some point in the future you're going to be able to 3D print a new liver for your <laughs> Right, exactly. It's not going to be rejectable because, because it's going to be your own tissue. Right. The, the, the extruded material is going to be your own tissue, your own biological material that yeah. they build a liver out of or a kidney or whatever, a heart, whatever it yeah. may be. And it will fit exactly into what your your organ was, because it, it essentially will be a clone, in a sense, right. of your organ. No yeah. rejection. I mean, yeah. so the FDA is going to deal with those issues too. Right, right, That's exactly. not going to be that far away. No, I know. I mean, it well, sounds like science fiction. On it now? I know. Yeah. It's, it's, yeah. it's amazing. So the FDA has got a lot of interesting stuff going on. In the FDA. The FDA is going to really be the, the anchor, I think, of, of our industry going forward. Uh, yeah. It has been for a long time. But I mean, yeah. in terms of dealing with these issues, how you deal with these things is going to be fascinating. Right. Thanks, Dirk. All right, well, we now turn to our CMSE Corner, which is our monthly segment where we chat with leading professionals in the field of portable coordinate metrology. Our partners, the Coordinate Metrology Society, represent our users, service providers, and original equipment manufacturers of close tolerance, large volume 3D measurement systems, software, and peripherals. The Society is the preeminent organization in this space, and their annual conference, the CMSE, is the place to be to see the latest and greatest products in the field. CMSE 2017 is going to take place in lovely Park City, Utah next July, and Dirk and I are already looking forward to it. We're going to be there. Hopefully you will be too. Well, one of the major initiatives that the Coordinate Metrology Society has undertaken in recent years is to develop a multi-level personnel certification program. Level one is a proctored exam, testing users' understanding of foundational theory and practice common to 3D metrology devices. Level two certification is a hands-on practical performance assessment using a portable coordinate measuring machine. Of course, if you're going to have certification exams, you need to provide training for candidates seeking to earn that certification. Our, our guest on this week's CMSE Corner, Gary Confalone, offers just that sort of training and support. His company, ECM Global Measurement Solutions, is a top metrology service provider in the Northeast. Uh, he's also the vice chair of the Coordinate Metrology Society's executive committee. So, Gary, welcome back to the show. Hey, Dirk. Hey, Mike. How's it going? Good, thanks for joining us. Well, let's start with the basics of the CMS certification program. What does the level one certification, for, exa for example, entail? Well, basically what it entails is the validation of a operator. Um, just to go back in the history, um, the certification committee started in 2009, and the level one test happened in 2015. Now, level one is a cognitive test, which essentially tests all the knowledge of an expert 3D metrologist. Um, we added level two certification, and what the level two would be is a hands-on certification. Now, you can visit the CMSC website, and it has all the credentials that you would need to, um, to apply. And Gary, why, why should a metrologist, either an entry-level person or a, ventra, a veteran, want this credential? Well, it's not, an, um, it, it's not a certification designed for an entry-level person. And it's really, there's, there's three reasons why, why it exists. Um, 
one would be you know most importantly to validate the expertise of a person um, you know we validate our equipment we calibrate it certify it but really up until this point there hasn't been any way to certify or or validate a person which is a big part of 3d metrology um, a lot of the new quality management systems whether it be ISO AS or NATCAP you know require some type of training and you, you will get the certification and become a elite member that's listed on the CMSC website. Now, if you're an entry-level person, I think that this, this certification gives people something to strive for, um, you know, something to work towards in their career to become certified. And the, the requirement, you know, in your working career is that you've done this for two years. So, and if you're a veteran, I think recertification is important, and it encourages people to stay current with the equipment and um, volunteer to help out at the society or in education, because there is professional development hours that are credited towards the recertification. Gary, let's talk about the application process itself. It is a little bit of a, of a, of a process that goes on there. So what, well, what, to, go ahead. yeah, go ahead, Gary. I'm sorry. sorry. Yeah, go ahead. I, was, I, just, I think you're going to talk about the application process anyway. Yep. Well, to apply, you um, first step would be to visit the website, cmsc.org, and the application is online. The, um, prior to, the experience you require, as I said before, was two years. And to uh, fill out the application, you also have to include three professional references. Now, once all this is submitted, it goes in for a peer review, and you will be accepted or rejected, and um, at that point, sign a code of ethics. Once you complete all this process, you can either take the exam at the annual CMSC conference, or you could take it at a remote proctor site. Um, East Coast Metrology is one of the remote proctor sites that you could take it at. So once your application is approved, how can interested parties prepare for the proctored examination itself? Well, again, on the website, there is a, um, a list of the five categories we call the body of knowledge that the certification covers. Um, first one being design interpretation, um, which is like blueprint reading, CAD, gd &T, and standards. So we'll be checking to make sure everyone has the basic knowledges of that. Um, device knowledge, uh, what equipment to use, when to use it, accuracy, environment, you know, time constraints, all play a part in choosing the right piece of equipment. Planning would be the third section. Um, that's pre-measurement planning, you know, coordinate systems, error budgets, what's going to be a deliverable, things like that. Then perform me measurements is probably the most critical part of the exam, and this is your setup, your moves, your um, accuracy checks, calibration checks, things like that. Then lastly, just, just like you're doing a job, it would be data analysis. You know, the gd &T, evaluating the data, SPC, uncertainty, you know, the basic knowledge of, of all these things. And you guys at ECM do provide some training for this, correct? Yes, we do. Um, we, we provide training either at our customer's facility or at our facility here. And um, what we've done is we've got together with NPL. You know, after the first certification, as you can imagine, um, the first question out of everybody's mouth is, well, how, how can we take a course or is there a textbook? So you know, myself and Keith Bevan Bev from N NPL got together and we formed a group to put this course together. And with the course, we also have a workbook that goes with it. The course is designed to be taken in two and a half days. And on the, that third day, the half day, you can take the online exam. And again, that can be done at our facility here or at our customer's facility, where we'll just take, because it's all online, we can just take the computer and Great. set it up. And people want to find out more, they can they can visit online at, at www.cmsc.org, correct? Yep. Great. Everything is everything is there, and uh, 
you can also contact us via web an email certification at cmsc.org. Great. Well, Gary, thank you. Gary Confalone, thank you again for joining us here on today's CMSC Corner. We're going to see, uh, I think we're going to see you before July, but we'll definitely see you in July in Utah for, uh, for CMSC 2017. Okay, fellas. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Thanks Gary. Gary. Talk to you soon. Yep. Bye-bye. Bye. Well, we, Dirk, you have a tech corner coming up, but before we do that, I got to cover a quick story that we well, did sure. from Bruce sure. Hamilton, because right. Bruce had a really cool story that I certainly resonated with. Okay. He, he called First Summer Job. It's a name of a, of a kind of a gently reflective, soft focus article by Bruce that appeared in Monday's issue of, of Quality Digest Daily. Well, you know, I say soft focus, but that doesn't mean there aren't some really sharp points sure. within this one. He had some really good things, I think, that he talked about here. The eponymous job that Hamilton describes in this article was at a seafood restaurant in Marina in lovely Ocean City, New Jersey. I've been there many times. Times. He was 13 at the time, but he lied about his age in order to secure the gig. And he relates the story of getting to know the owner, Chris, who was an immigrant with whom he learned the business, starting apparently with a lot of painting. I'm not quite <laughs> sure why you have to paint so much stuff in a seafood restaurant in Marina, but Hamilton learned four important lessons through that job. I want to run through them with you because these are really good. One, you don't have to be book smart to be smart. Chris, the guy that owned this place, uh, was illiterate, as he yeah. says. He was an illiterate Italian immigrant. Maybe he wasn't illiterate in Italian, but probably in, in English. Yeah. Uh, but he had a great sense for how to run his business. So he didn't have the book smarts, but he was very smart. The other thing was attitude first. Bruce didn't know anything. He was 13 when he got this job. Remember, he didn't know anything about doing any work, but he had a good attitude, and that was more important than the experience. Third is that age isn't an excuse for inactivity. Chris M., the guy who, who owned this, this place, was in his 60s. Wow. And he was up there painting the masks and doing all kinds yeah. of stuff, and he was getting right in there and doing it. Fourth and finally, leaders' success derives from their penchant to develop others around them. And, and Chris did that, and Chris really helped Bruce, and he really learned a lot from that experience. Well, I learned a lot from an experience too that I had. I thought it was cute to relate about this. I've heard that, about some of your work experiences. <laughs> well, this coincidentally was also when I was a teen, also in New Jersey. I had a job at the Fireplace Restaurant in Paramus. And uh, you know, it was a great job. It was my first gig I ever had and I was a bus boy. And after working there for about three or four months, I walked right up to the manager and I said, I deserve a raise. <laughs> I want 25 cents more an hour. I want to go from 315 to 340. And I got it. I got the raise. He said, you're, doing, you're right, you're doing a good job. And I, I got the thing. It was a big thing for me, right? I still remember it. Uh, you know, and that was another one uh, that I, to add to Bruce's four, my own one was that, you know, doing a job really well, it, it, regardless of whatever job it is, it builds a tremendous amount of confidence and self-worth and, and expressing that confidence and asking for what you want really is the path to getting, getting what you want. So first jobs I think are great. They build that foundation for self-assurance and self-motivation and, uh, and, and Bruce and I had that common experience of being teenagers in Jersey. <laughs> Doing our first job, so that That's was awesome. That was pretty cool. I, and you like that that article too? I oh think. yeah, yeah, so yeah. We yeah. talked about it. It was a cute one. All right. Well, we're going to now turn to our tech corner because this is a, another good one. Dirk uh, gets to play with some new gadgets sent to him by an uh, equipment or uh, or software manufacturer. Uh, in this case, we have the wireless LightStar torque wrench and the 600 handheld data collector, both from. ASI Datamite. Together, this combination promises to make torque auditing much easier. So, Dirk, take it away, man. That's right, Mike. Well, thanks a lot. Uh, as Mike said, we're going to look at uh, two instruments today from ASI uh, Datamite. We've got the, uh, the LightStar uh, torque wrench, and we've got the 600 data collector. And uh, this is a torque wrench. We'll get into it a little bit. Uh, it's you could use it for production, you could use it as for assembly, that's probably not normally how we'd use it because this is really a precise instrument, it's not really a production instrument. It's really intended for inspectors to go out on the line and check the torque on uh, bolts that have already, or fasteners that have already been put in place. So this is an auditing piece of equipment. Very lightweight, um, all the uh, controls are right at your fingerprint, uh, fingertips, and we'll get to that in just a little bit. It's Bluetooth enabled, which means that um, it will communicate wirelessly to the data collector over Bluetooth. And I won't get into how you pair it. We don't need to know if you've ever had a Bluetooth device, pairing is pairing. We're just going to get right into how you might use it. So um, I'm going to go first of all into the collector and I'm going to select what ASA Datamite calls a route or a, a, a measurement plan, a test plan. And we have one here called seat belt. And I'm just going to bring that up and we'll look on the screen here. And you'll see on the screen, the very first thing it asks for is it wants to know who is the operator that's going to be doing this test because you want an audit trail. You want to know who's doing all this. Now, I could manually enter all this information in, but instead, I am going to scan my name from my 
employee badge. And now it comes up and it puts my name, and there it is, it puts my name in there. And also notice it shows a picture get this oriented right, it shows a picture of my test setup. Here's my test setup, here's a picture. We're seeing a lot of this now. Almost all, uh, almost all user interfaces use a visually guided uh, routine to step the operator through the measurements that they are going to take. There's a picture and, an, and there's arrows or circles that tell the operator where to go. And this one is telling me, go to the first bolt and take a measurement. So that's what I'm going to do. Now set this down here. I'm going to take my torque wrench and I'm going to go to the first bolt and I'm going to test it. Now, I don't know if you saw that, green light flashed. It told me that I am within the boundaries that I'm looking for. And if I come back up here and look at the screen, we can see that there is my reading, 30.38 uh, Newton meters, I believe, and a little green checkbox telling me that it passed. So now I'm going to go to, the and it points to the next bolt. So now I'm going to go to the next bolt and I'm going to do that one. Again green light flashes. By the way, let me point out, uh, you know how torque wrench works, of course. It, it's it's, it's uh, force times distance. Now with some torque wrenches, you have to be careful that you pull or apply force on the wrench at the right place on the wrench, otherwise you're changing this distance. That affects the measurement. With this wrench, as long as you're applying force anywhere within this handle, you're going to get an accurate measurement. So it doesn't matter whether I pull here or here or how the force is distributed across my hand accurate measurement. Let's go to the third bolt and we'll do that one. And again, light flashes. If I was under or over, um, I would get a different reading and hopefully we'll see that on this last bolt. If not, we'll, we'll force one. Okay, so let me, let me tighten this one up and we'll go back in and do this again. So let me over tighten one and let me go back into my routine again just because I want to show you what a fail looks like. So again, we're pointing to the first bolt. I'm going to, there we go, whoops. And it failed that bolt. Now I'm going to go ahead and do the rest of them. Whoops, sorry, it's asking me to retake the measurement. Okay, I'm just going to step through these real quick. I just wanted to show you that you do get, you do get an actual fail on these, okay. And so that would, that's what would happen. You would get your red lights down here, and then on the display itself, it would give you an up arrow or down arrow to show you whether you were above or below your measurement. Let's take a look at a couple other things here. I'm going to step back in. I want to show you something else here. Let's go back in and take another measurement because there's something else there we go. And now I'm going to view this last measurement that I took. Because I want to show you something. We go on the screen. So the way some torque wrenches work or torque validation systems work is they look for a peak reading on the measurement. Um, the the uh, LightStar and the 600 software uh, use something called Smart Wrench. They're looking for something different. And we can demonstrate this by looking at the torque curve on that fastener. So notice it's climbing up. That says I'm pulling on, uh, pulling on the wrench. I pull, I pull, I pull, and then notice it flattens out. That is where the, the, the nut or the bolt actually breaks free. It starts to turn. So it breaks free from the mechanical forces holding it in place. That is the point that the software records the torque for that bolt because that ASI data might says that is really the most accurate way for reading uh, the, the amount of torque that is on that particular fastener at that time. Okay, now the last thing I want to show you is that when you're finished with a run, we've measured four bolts, it comes back and it asks you for the operator again. So if I wanted to do another test run or go to another car and take another test run, it's going to come back and ask me to enter my operator name again. Why? Well, imagine what could happen, if we come back to the main camera here, what could happen is that I could be taking measurements and then I get tired, I want to take a break. I hand the wrench over to Mike. Mike starts taking measurements, but the recorder is telling me that it's me. 
So Mike takes a bunch of measurements under my name. Well, now if there's something wrong, we don't know who took the measurements, right? W would, did Dirt take them? Did Mike take them? Who took them? So by forcing the operator to have to enter their name each time, scan it or whatever, you always have an audit trail of, for who is doing what when. By the way, that's the default that can be turned off. You don't have to run it that way. Personally, I think that actually is a good way to use it. Uh, a couple other things. The wrench does not just communicate the torque measurement to the collector. It also communicates all of the information about the wrench, which allows the software to do a couple of interesting things. Number one, the route or the, the, uh, um, uh, uh, the, test, uh, the test routine checks to make sure that you're using the right route. So this route t is programmed to use a W75 wrench, which is what this is. If I was to pick up a different wrench, a, a W25, and pair it, and then launch that routine, it's gonna, routine's gonna come back and say, hey, guess what? You're using the wrong wrench. So you, it kind of foolproofs uh, the process for the operator, making sure that they're always using the right tool. The other thing that it does, we'll come back to the gauge cam here, I'm going to go back into the menu. Oh, I can, uh, here we go. Come back into the menu. I'm not totally familiar. Okay, there we go. And we'll go down to our wrench. And we're going to select the wrench that we used, which is that one. And I'm going to point out something really important that shows up on this information. This all comes in from the wrench. Notice the very last column, calibration due in 339 days. And the column just above it is uh, when it was calibrated last. As we've talked about on the show, anytime you, you pick up an instrument that is calibrated, you need to look at the calibration tag to make sure that you are using an instrument that is within its calibration interval. If it isn't, you shouldn't be using it. This tells the operator what the calibration uh, when the calibration w is due. And if it's within the interval, you should use it. This software doesn't do it, but uh, a new release of the software actually brings up a warning. So even if the operator doesn't check this, they'll get a warning that the wrench that they just picked up is out of, uh, is, uh, out of its calibration interval and should be calibrated. A couple other things. Um, the data collector itself, very rugged, four foot drop to a concrete floor and it won't break. So for people like me, that's good to know. Wi-Fi connectivity. So once I take all my measurements out on the shop floor, I can go back into the front office, download it onto a computer and export that data, uh, bring it into uh, you know, SPC software or you know, any other kind of software I want. Just work with the data however you feel fit. Um, there is some basic SPC software also available on the data collector itself. Also, you can upload data into the collector, which means if I want to send, uh, do program some routes offline, I can do that, then upload them into the data collector, and they're ready to go for the next time the operator picks it up. They'll have the latest routines. Barcode scanner. You notice that I scanned my name in. I could also put a barcode on the thing that I'm measuring, scan that, and it will load the appropriate test setup. So in other words, I don't have to go through the menu, select which setup I want to run. It's going to do it for me. So again, all of this kind of takes the operator out of it a little bit and makes sure that data entry issues aren't a problem. Finally, I save this for last because I, I love cute little things that people do to their products to make them easier to use. If you've ever worked on a shop floor, you know very often the lighting isn't all that good. Then on top of that, you may have to reach inside a recess and it's dark and you're trying to see where to put your tool, find the fastener and you can't see, so you take out your cell phone and you shine the light in there and you got the tool in your cell phone and you're trying to see what you're doing, right? Well, they thought about that and so they have put on this a flashlight in the tip. There we go, off, on. Put a flashlight on the tip, they go down. Now you can go into a dark space and you can see what you're doing. Sounds like a simple thing, but it's the simple things like that that just say that they're thinking about the operator, thinking about what happens out on the shop floor. I like that. So if you want more information on either one of these tools, uh, there is a link underneath the player page. This is the LightStar uh, wireless torque wrench and the 600 data collector. There's a link underneath the player page that'll download a PDF. You can get more information or you can simply go to asidatamite.com, look up the full range of products including these. So thanks to the guys at ASI Datamites for sending that on to us. And Mike, back to you. Thank you, Derek. There you have it. Yes, from ASI Datamite. ASI Datamite, as you say. The wireless LightStar Torque Wrench and the 600 Wi-Fi Data Collector. 
No truth to the rumor that you can remove that head and put a lightsaber on top of it. <laughs> yeah. no, that I was trying there, it didn't work though, yeah. <laughs> Although the flashlight is close. <laughs> it's pretty cool, that's right. <laughs> Thanks guys, that was really, really good tech corner from, uh, from yep. ASI Dad. It might, nice job, Dirk. Thanks. All right, well that's our show for today. Uh, we want to remind you though, or tell you, uh, that we have a webinar coming up for you on Monday. That's Monday, October 24th from Tuve Sued. Uh, the webinar's title is AITF16949, Preparing for the Transition. If you're in the automotive space, you're gonna to wanna to check that one out. Uh, the live webinar comes up on Monday the 24th again at 11 a.m. Pacific, 2 p.m. Eastern. Dirk, you're gonna be hosting that. And uh, Carlene Abacciocini, I believe, is the uh, presenter for that. Uh, Carlene is, uh, is an expert, expert auditor within the automotive space. So uh, again, if you're in automotive, you're gonna wanna definitely check that one out. Um, there'll be an email coming up on Monday morning right before the webinar. If you've missed it, you can, uh, you can register for it right there and attend it. Again, that's uh, 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. p.m. Pacific, uh, this Monday, October 24th. So keep your eye on your e email you inbox. That's right. Well, that's our show. Dirk, thank there you for you being here. Thank you all for being here. Gary uh, Confalone. Thank you, Gary Confalone, for joining us. Thank you, ASI Datamite, again, for giving us a great tech corner. You all have a great weekend. We'll see you next week. So long. Bye.